Holy Father, lift up this message. I ask that you speak to our hearts. Your word is our guide. Your word is our plan for salvation. It is everything we need in this world. Your word is more than sufficient to lead us and guide us through trials, tribulation, health problems, and other things that we face in this world, Lord. We know without a doubt that you are always with us, and we wait for your glorious appearing. Father, teach us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, Brother Don brought the first 15 verses of chapter 5, and I'm commissioned, not commissioned, but <laughs> I'm, get paid. I'm assigned to uh, bring uh, Galatians 16 to 26. I'm going to warn you, and uh, it's, it's not going to be done all this week. It's too much in it for it to be done all this week. So next week, I'll be bringing the, the end of it. But I want to stress and I want to mention the whole book of, of Galatians. It was Paul warning the church not to go into the works of the, of the flesh, not to go into the works, not to, not to believe the Judaizers, and also not to believe, not to fall back in temptation and sin. The surprising things that we read in, in, in chapter 5, it's about sin, it's about falling into sin, it's about love, but it's not written to the world. It's not written to the unbeliever. Like most of the books in the Bible, it's written to the believer. It's exalting them, it's admonishing them, it's warning them not to fall into these temptations and, and go back to a works-oriented religion. And that's what Paul is doing today in this in these. Paul's concern for the Gal church of Galatia was that the Judaizers was bringing them into the works of the Lord, which will feed the flesh and lead people away from Christ, leading them into sin, giving in to temptation servicing the flesh, not the Lord. The word says to be holy because he is holy. Sin is a problem in the church today. That's right, my granddaughter says. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about our congregation. I'm talking about the church worldwide. Sin is a problem. As Christians... We battle temptation and sin all the time, every day. And I was going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm not. You know, who's sin free? And I, because I know that I would, I would not see a hand up. Right? We all sin. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And if it wasn't for the sacrifice that God made, we would be in the same predicament as the unbelievers. The question is, how then do we battle temptation? Do we rely on our own power and strength, which is dealing with sin according to the flesh? Or do we deal with our trials, tribulation, persecution, illness through the Spirit? If I was to ask you here today, you all would say yes, through the Spirit. Yeah, through the Spirit. But it's a lot easier said than done. enhance this letter to the Galatians because it was a lot easier said than done. We all know we should walk by the Spirit. We all know we should live by the Spirit. But it's not always easy. The uh, introduction that Martin, Pastor Martin gave was right on. How many times do we have problems and we start wanting to fix it ourselves? We want to be in control of our own lives. We want to take it and, and then we just get nothing but more trouble. And then we have to realize we've got to turn it over to God. Churches in North America are facing the same problems that we face in association with sin. Their pastors and leaders teaching their members how to travel through the, the road to sinlessness, which I have to caution you is not going to happen until the Lord comes back. And happiness depends on establishing good habits. 
want to bring up a message I've been listening to by a pastor. I'm not going to mention his name, his church's name. I'm not bringing this up to be divisive. I'm bringing this up to, as an example of what we should not be doing. This pastor, I believe, has good intention for his congregation. I believe he wants to teach his congregation how to travel, how to navigate the problems of the world. But it's not going to be done by me establishing a good habit. Good habits are good. But what happens when I establish that good habit? Who's done the work? I have. And what does Galatians teach us? That it's not by our righteousness that we are saved. It's by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The blood that covers us is his righteousness. There's nothing we can do on our own. Jesus says that in John 15. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. Because you can do nothing without me. Nothing. We all want to. We're all a bunch of control freaks. That we are, some more than others, but we're all control freaks. We all want to control our own destiny. But there is nothing we can do on our own. So the question is, how do we walk in the spirit? I pray that this message will give us a biblical foundation to grow spiritually in order to walk in the spirit. And I'm going to tell you a story before we move on and why... It scares me when I hear pastors teaching and selling books about it. And you hear the book so you never forget. You know what it reminds me of? Of that resolution I make every New Year's. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And then I end up doing this. Zero. Nothing. Nothing that I made this resolution. So me trying to establish a good habit. Like I said, I know good habits are good. And I know how to establish that habit. You know, you, you do a work and you do it for 30 days and bam, you're, you're, you got it, right? But I also know that we are in the spiritual battle. So let me, t let me touch on one of my experiences. When I became a Christian, the Lord relieved me of a lot of things. One thing he didn't relieve me of was cigarettes. I smoked. I lied about how much I spoke. I told everyone I smoked like a pack, a pack and a half a day. The truth was I was smoking three, three and a half packs a day. The same thing that killed my father. At 56 years old, I was doing. But you couldn't tell me that. Okay. I remember every holiday it was. Somebody at that holiday. Either one of my in-laws, one of my wife, one of my kids, they were going to mention my cigarette smoking. And I have to tell you, I enjoyed smoking. I loved it. So one Thanksgiving, when they all sat down at the table, I looked at them all, and I said, I've got something to say to you. And they all looked at me, and I said, some of you are going to die before me. Some of you are going to die after me. So leave me alone about my cigarette smoking. <laughs> Ever since then, my wife did exactly that. She never said anything to me again about me smoking cigarettes. Okay? But that's how much, well, that's how dark my heart was. And also that's how much I wanted that idol to stay with me. Right? Well, after I got saved, I was working. I was coming to this church. After I would leave this church, I'd light up. You know, just like being on an airplane. After you get off that airplane, man, you got to have that cigarette because, you know, you're going through withdrawals already. So, but the problem was that people on my job sites that I was working with were looking at me. And you know, there's always two verses that every non believer knows. The whole world knows these two verses. Don't judge me, man. Judge not, at least you be judged. That's one of them. And isn't your body a temple? I 
done if you were a Christian and your body's a temple? Then what are you doing smoking? That didn't bother me too much because I knew they were hypocrites too. Okay, they weren't. I wasn't the only hypocrite on the job site. What bothered me was that my Christian witness was being stumbled, that people were stumbling because of my witness, because I said I was a Christian, because I used to like to evangelize on the job site, because I used to like to speak about God, but then I used to go light up a cigarette. So I told my wife one Sunday on the way to church because I was being convicted. And I said, honey, I believe the Lord is leading me to quit smoking. And she said, okay. You know, I said, so after church, let's go to the drugstore and we'll buy some Nicorettes. And I'll take those Nicorettes and I'll quit smoking. And that's what I did. Sun Monday morning when I got to go to work in my office, because I used to smoke out in the garage in my office, I had three packs of cigarettes laying there. I had willpower, man. I was going to so I had it. I grabbed those Nicorettes and went marching out to work, so I had to take them. And it said, you can take up to nine. Well, I didn't take nine. I didn't take eight. I didn't take seven. I took only six. And I got so sick to my stomach that it wasn't funny. I'm not going to go into the details because it isn't very pleasant. But I was sick. And I'm telling you, so I got home, went to bed, got up early that next morning, went out to my office. The cigarettes were sitting there. The Nicorettes were sitting there. I looked at the Nicorettes, and just looking at them in their package, I got sick again. <laughs> I'm going, whoa. So I looked up, and I swear this happened. I looked up to God, and I said, make sure you're like an Italian. I thought you wanted me to quit, right? He almost said to me, and where were you? No. <laughs> I said, I thought you wanted me to quit. And in my head, I don't... It, I'm not going to say it was audible, but I heard the voice of God. He said, yes, I do, but I'll help you to quit. That day, I didn't take the Nicorettes. I didn't take the cigarettes. I didn't have one cigarette. I didn't have one physical withdrawal, not one. Anybody who's ever been addicted to nicotine knows what I'm talking about. It is hard to quit. They say it's just as hard to quit that as heroin. So, the only thing I did have was that psychological thing because I couldn't answer a phone without having a cigarette in my hand. I couldn't type a letter. I couldn't do anything without a cigarette in my hand. So, that was still there. So, when I got home, my son Nick was going to BCA. He was like six years old, I think he was. And he just found out that I quit. And he came running, in, running over to me and threw his arms around me. And he said, Dad, I heard you quit smoking. I said, yeah. He goes, I've been praying every night for you. I looked up to heaven again. I said, that is dirty. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I had that psychological feeling that I wanted to smoke, I saw my little boy wrap his arms around me and tell me how he was praying for me. And I never had another psychological withdrawal again. But that's a, that's a thing of, do I do it myself? Do I, do, a, do I create a habit? Or does the Spirit of God get me through it? That's a prime example. We'll be getting more into that in this study and showing other examples, not of me, thank God, but of, uh, <laughs> but of people in the Bible that have gone through the same thing, that done things in the Spirit, done things in the, in the flesh, and I'm hopefully it's going to be interesting. We are in a, spa, a spiritual battle. Good habits are not going to stop the spiritual battle from happening. In Ephesians 10, I mean 6.10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities against the powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 
So trying to get a habit to be good, because this whole study encompassed sin, it encompassed uh, Christian living, it encompassed every aspect about it. Trying to win this spiritual battle by forming a habit is like bringing a letter opener to a sword fight. And I use sword purposely. Because we're going to find out we're going to need the sword sword of the spirit to navigate our way through this life. And anybody that thinks we don't, and I'm not getting into legalism. I'm not telling people, you got to read your Bible every day. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to, no. But I'm telling you, you need this. We all do. It's such a blessing. Uh, again, I was at chapel and listening to those kids recite their Bible verse of the week is a blessing. And watching how the Lord forms a message out of the Bible verses that individual teachers say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But when they all get together from one to another, and I'll tell you, the little ones are really great too, the big ones too. But it just, they're forming a message of the gospel of good news. And it's the Holy Spirit doing it. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, tells us that Scripture is sufficient for all our needs in our daily lives, helps us through our trials, tribulations, persecutions, illnesses. We just heard about Tammy. Praise God for that. The week before that, we heard, I can't say this. I was reminded not to say We heard of other people being cured. Uh, I'll explain to you later. <laughs> and family problems that we all have. In Romans 15.4, Romans 15.4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. All Scriptures God breathed, and it was written for our salvation but also that we may have hope. Galatians 5, as I was talking about earlier, is a roadmap teaching us how to live in the Spirit while waiting for the glorious appearing of our Lord. I say the roadmap because using Scripture in my, it is my prayer for us that we will learn to and be strengthened, strengthen our spiritual walk being conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'll get into the message. As it, my practice is, it's always to go back a few verses. And uh, I like that from Pastor Martin. <laughs> go back. To, um, so up, I have you turn and read the whole, the whole passage, and then we'll get into breaking it down. But Galatians 5, starting in verse 13, we'll read all the way to 26, and then we'll break it down. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, at least you are consumed by one another. Verse 16, saying then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not, you do not so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which also is drug use, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, 
dissension, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like of which I told I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And I want to remind you, we're going to get to a passage where Paul is not saying that this is all easy. The minute we accept Christ, we're done. We sin no more and we're walking in the spirit and, and life is grand. He's not saying that. The points that I have taken out of this study from these passages are this. Paul warns not to return to bondage. Paul said, point two, Paul said, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Paul tells the church the law is fulfilled by love. Walking in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will examine, like I told you earlier, people in scripture that both walked in the flesh and walked in the spirit and see what they have done and see how they did it. And we'll also go through some scripture that will help us walk in the spirit hopefully training us up to do it, teaching us daily how to do it. Another point is what love is according to Scripture and what it looks like. And like I mentioned earlier, how we can grow spiritually in order to walk in the Spirit. First point, Paul warns us not to return to bondage. This is great because I'm going to do it again so I don't have to worry about the time this time. I can just cut it out. <clears throat> Hopefully I had a good ending. Galatians 5, 13 to 15 says, For you, brethren, have not been called to liberty, has been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. In these verses, Paul is warning the church not to return to the bondage of sin and the law. Not that the law is sin. The law shows us two things. Our sinful nature and that we couldn't keep it. If we could keep the law, it would have saved us. And God made it clear when he gave it to the law to the Hebrews that if they kept it, they would live. Just like us, they couldn't keep the law. And he just gave them ten commandments, right? Ten. He didn't give them a whole book of commandments. He said, keep these ten. But in the garden, remember, he only gave Adam and Eve one commandment. One. And they couldn't keep it. So I would venture to say that if any one of us had taken Adam and Eve's place, we would have broke that first commandment too. You shall not eat of the tree of good and bad, the knowledge of good and bad. In Deuteronomy 4.1, it says, Deuteronomy 4.1, Now hear, O Israel, Listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers has given you. And this is important. And I hope, I pray that every person who teaches, preaches, evangelizes, talks to their family, hears this. 
You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. There's another place in Scripture where it tells us not to add or subtract, and that's in Revelation. And in Revelation, it tells us whatever we add or subtract will either be added or taken away from us. The Word of God is not to be trifled with. It is not to be used as a program. The Word of God is living, and it's here for our benefit. Not to sell books, although if they sell books and it's, and it's sent by God, that's good. Not to sell programs. And not to fill the seats, because we want everyone that God calls to sit in the seats not what the program calls. The problem was neither Israel, like I said, Israel could or, or the church could keep the law. Just try taking the good person test. It'll verify and confirm that you can't keep the law. I used to do this in evangelism. We used to go out and ask, are you going to heaven? And everybody would say, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, I'm going. I hope so. I hope I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Oh, yeah? How do you know? Some would say, well, I was baptized as a baby, and we'd have to talk to them about that. Others would say, because I'm a good person. And we'd say, you are? Well, can you, you want to take a good person test? And they would say, uh, okay. And so we'd say to them, have you ever lied? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that make you? Human. No, no, no. What does that make you? Have you ever stolen anything? Even something small. Even when you were young. Yeah, what does that make you? A thief. Have you ever looked at a member of the opposite sex with lust? Well, that made you an adulterer at heart. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Yeah, well, that makes you a blasphemer. Those were just four of the commandments. I don't want to get into coveting. I don't want to get into, you know, false witness. But that was how we would bring people to the realization that they needed a Savior. And that is important. The liberty that Paul speaks is from sin. The death of Jesus on the cross freed us from the power of sin and death. Luke 4 18 says, Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captors, captives, and to recover sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are in Oppressed. Jesus gives the good news to the poor in spirit that they will have the spirit of God living inside them and they'll no longer be poor of spirit. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Whoever hurt you, he can take the pain away. Those who abused you, whether it was a parent or not, he can take the pain away. Those who were raised without parents, God the Father is your Father in heaven. And he is a perfect Father in heaven. He is one that you can always count on. One that will never forsake you. Never steer you the wrong way. Always be with you. Always guide you. He gave sight to the blind. And he wasn't just talking physical sight which he did, we know. Even a man from childbirth was blind. But he gave sight to us so that we could see with our eyes and we could perceive the word of God. We were all blind at one time. Doesn't the song say that? I once was blind, but now I see. We were all blind at one time. I don't know when it happened to you, for you or happened to you, 
but we all were blind at one time. Some were raised in the church, and they went along until they made their profession. God bless them. Others like me, I wasn't raised in the church. He had a lot of doing to open up my eyes. He freed us from the bondage of sin and death. And we have liberty now. Romans 6.18 says, Romans 6.18, Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, of holiness. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. What fruit did you have? Sorry, what fruit did you have then in the things which are now, which now you are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit in holiness and the end, everlasting life. This passage may scare some people, may offend some people, being a slave to God. But we understand the meaning. When we swear allegiance to our Lord Jesus Christ, he becomes our master. That means he controls our life, or he should be controlling our life. And we go from slaves to sons and daughters of God. We don't stay slaves. Jesus tells us in, I believe it's John 8, he goes, a slave doesn't abide forever, but a son does. And we were given eternal life, and we abide forever in that. Galatians 4, starting at verse 5, says, Galatians 4, 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters. And if sons and daughters, then, I'm just doing that, I'm adding something to it, and then an heir of God through Christ. But we know when he's talking sons, he's talking about mankind, so it means daughters too. 1 Corinthians 1 8, 118, I mean. 1 Corinthians 118. And that's what I meant with some people may be offended, some people may not understand. It says, For the message of the cross. Is foolishness for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this, this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in wisdom of God, in the wisdom of God, the world through the wisdom did not God know? It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jew requests a sign, the Greek seeks after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jew a stumbling block, to the Greek foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than mighty than, than men. For you, see, you, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world that the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that are, that no flesh can glory in his presence. But of him who, who you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Paul says, do not use the liberty, liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Paul is writing us who are in Christ and have been liberated and freed from bondage. Do not use the liberty to satisfy the, for satisfaction, to satisfy the flesh, the lust of the flesh. And Paul describes the lust of the flesh. This can become a problem in the church. Whether or not you believe once saved, always saved, or you believe you can give your salvation up, it's still a problem for what he says in the end. In Galatians 5, 17, you turn back to Galatians 5, 17. For the, lusts of, for the, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the likes of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's my belief that a believer cannot practice those things. I didn't say a believer can't stumble and can't backslide. I said, but they can't practice it. If you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ, if you get into any of these things and the other things that are not mentioned here, the hound from heaven is, is on you. You are being chastised. And what does Hebrews tell us? Right? To actually be thankful for the chastisement of the Lord. Because a father chastises his son. And if we are being chastised by the Lord, we know that we are children of God. We know we are children of God. In, I touched that wire again. In, in Romans, in Romans 7.14 it says, Romans 7.14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Now that shows you an example of somebody warring with the flesh. You don't need to leave with her. You can stay. I like a hallelujah and an amen every once in a while. And she knows just where, to, just where to put it. If then I do what I will to do, not to do, I agree with the law. That it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that there is in, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And one day, we won't have this flesh to have to worry about. For to will is present with me, but now to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I 
will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of, the, of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he gives the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. In 1 Corinthians 6, 8, and there's a purpose for me reading this. This mimics a lot of what uh, Paul was saying in the other verses, but there's one thing that was missing. This 1 Corinthians 6, 8. No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that unrighteousness, unrighteous, the, uh, sorry, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Amen and hallelujah. And that's all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. If you have sworn that Jesus Christ is your Lord, that you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and you confess it with your mouth, you were some. And some were such of us, some of these. You are no longer under the law. You're under grace. And with that, I'm going to end next week. And in our perfect time. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice you made. Father God, we thank you for sending your only begotten son that whoever believes in him is not under the law, not under condemnation. And at the end of the age, that we will be with you and be with your son. And you will be our light. And you will be our God in the new Jerusalem, on the new earth, as it says in Revelation 22. Lord, I look forward to the day of the glorious appearing of your son, Jesus Christ, in the scar one, calling his church, Lord. And I pray that this message goes out and touches those who know you and those who don't know you. And those who don't know you, I pray they make a profession of faith today, that they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and they believe in their heart that you raised your son from the dead. And he's sitting right now, the right hand of your throne waiting for you to send him back. Lord, I thank you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.